Would you consider your walk with Jesus humble? What exactly does he expect from us in the area of humility? Over the next four episodes, we are going to dig into this spirit of humility and look at his example so that we can decrease and he can increase in our lives. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Closer to Jesus podcast. My name is Ashley Enos, and I'm convinced that the answer to every problem is a deeper understanding of who Jesus is and how he shares his heart with us. Colossians 2, 3 tells us that in him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Each episode will be dedicated to strengthening our relationship with Jesus and growing more in love with him every day, hanging on the promise of James 4, 8, which says, if we draw closer to God, he will draw closer to us. As a Christian, humility is one of the gauges that tells us if our walk with Jesus is on the right track. We know that being obedient to the Lord is, is important in all situations, being obedient to the word and keeping ourselves humble in front of God. If our spirit isn't humble, then something is wrong. So today we're going to look at the question of what is God's perspective on a humble spirit? How do we know that what our walk is demonstrating mirrors his expectations? Micah 6 and 8 He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. A threefold cord is not easily broken, and in Micah 6 and 8, the Lord is telling us to combine justice with mercy and humility. In Hebrews, the word humility means to be modest. It is the same meaning we find in Proverbs 11 and 2, when pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with lovely is wisdom. Humility is a trait that we take on. It's something we demonstrate in our actions towards others. It's easily seen and observable, and if we don't have it, then something's off. In Romans 12, 3, Paul tells us, For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So Paul tells us to be sober-minded, but what does that mean? In our carnal flesh, which is a term the Bible used, which is just our own natural way of being, we are very self-seeking. We want what is best for us. But to be sober-minded is to be spiritually minded and to think what is best in the Spirit, what is best for the kingdom of God. And that requires a humbling of our needs and what we want and a better perspective, a larger perspective of the kingdom of God. To be spiritually minded means we put spiritual outcomes first, not our immediate gratification or what's best for our own lives, but what is best for the kingdom of God. When Satan tempted Eve, he tempted her by using her carnal desire for knowledge and power. Genesis 3, 5 says, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Pride was the bait that set the trap for Adam and Eve. They ate the fruit, only the outcome was not what they expected. They thought they would be in a better position, but their pride had caused them to fall. It had caused them to be in a lower position than when they began. Instead of making life better, their decision to listen to the deceiver only made their lives worse. Humility and pride can never coexist. And the great challenge facing every single Christian today is, will you lay down your own life to humble yourself as a servant for Christ? So if the greatest question for every Christian is, can you lay down your own life? A good example from the Word of God is John the Baptist. John the Baptist was born from a miracle. His parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth, they had waited a long time to conceive. Elizabeth's cousin, Mary, also had a miracle on her hands. Her son, Jesus, was born of the Holy Ghost. These two boys would grow up with purpose. John would need Jesus, and Jesus would need John. There would be a time, however, when John would have to declare a truth that is important for every single believer. He must increase, but I must decrease. John three twenty five through 31 Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptized, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. 
He that hath a bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. Growing as a Christian and becoming closer to Jesus means decreasing. Decreasing in our own importance. Decreasing our life, the value of who we are and what we want compared to Jesus. But just like John said, his joy was fulfilled. When we lose our lives for the Lord's sake, we will find a purpose, a life brimming with hope, a meaningful life because we are helping to advance the one true God. John's disciples learned a lesson that day. They were following John and they were upset because somebody else was coming and doing what John did. But John told them he must increase and I must decrease. John understood authority in the kingdom of heaven and he understood that authority and humility work together our purpose is to make a way for jesus the savior of the whole world and just as john the baptist was a voice of the one crying in the wilderness prepare ye the way of the lord make his path straight our ultimate purpose is to give room for the king of glory to come in pride keeps us from promoting the lord over ourselves god wants to use us to make a difference in his kingdom but he will only trust a submitted vessel to do the work. He must be greater. We must decrease so that he can increase. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. How do we promote Jesus? What are some practical ways to humble ourselves so that he can increase? The first thing we could do is to submit ourselves to his lordship. So that sounds very ancient, (laughs) to submit to his lordship. That doesn't sound like it's relevant to today, but he is lord of our lives, and we are part of an ancient kingdom. He is the ancient of days. And so just like a child submits to a parent's decision, we obey what Jesus tells us to do and acknowledge that he knows everything. He knows everything. And so we're not submitting to someone who doesn't know very much. We're not submitting to someone who might try and figure it out. He is God over everything. And so we submit our lives to him and let him be the decision maker. Let him be the one who guides us and keeps us. He puts every piece of the puzzle in place and knows the outcome of every situation. If something is broken, he knows how to fix it. If something is wrong, then he knows how to make it right. Nothing and nobody is higher than Jesus. We fall under his leadership. We submit to his authority. A second thing we want to try to do is to follow his commandments. So we submit to his authority. He is Lord of our lives. And that means that we actively participate in the plan of salvation. We read his word and diligently seek him. It isn't enough to just want the blessing. We need to desire and crave the blesser. When Jesus tells us what to do, we gladly obey because we love him and want to please him. It may not be easy for us. It may not be easy for our our flesh. It might be something beyond our comfort zone. It might cause us to have to push into areas we want to run away from. But his ways are always right. And to follow him means to be completely obedient to what he says. Another part of Jesus being Lord of our lives and walking in humility is to forgive. So forgiving others is a very humbling way to live. Forgiving your enemy, the one who has done you wrong, who's caused you pain, is the exact opposite of what our flesh wants to do. But it is a thing that the Lord requires of us. He asks us to walk in humility, and it is very humbling to forgive somebody. We want vengeance. We want them to suffer like we have suffered. We want to tell our side of the story. We want them to look as foolish as we feel. There are all kinds of feelings wrapped up in why we don't want to forgive. But Jesus asks us to lay down those feelings and to simply walk in obedience to his word. But remember, Jesus asks us to walk in the spirit of God, to think like he thinks and to do what he does and to put ourselves second next to his will. So if he says it is better for us to forgive, that's what we do. And it doesn't even require a lot of thinking about it. If you're having trouble forgiving somebody... 
I said, if you wake up every day and you struggle, here's, here's a practical application of the word. You simply say, I forgive them out of obedience. I don't feel like I forgive them. I'm still in pain because of them, but I forgive them out of obedience to the word. And when you do that enough, friends, and you pray for them and you bless them out of obedience, God will move in your heart and you will find yourself so blessed and so glad that God gave you that opportunity that it will make everything worth it. You will thank him for what you've gone through. And I know that sounds crazy, but it's true. Just hold on, keep doing it and don't give up. So if you're having trouble, say out loud, out of obedience to God's word, I forgive and call out their name and ask the Lord to bless them. Through the power of the Holy Ghost, you can move on and even be grateful for what happened because it has brought you closer to Jesus. It helps build a relationship to Jesus. And so another final step you could do, and there's probably a lot more not listed here, but you can also evangelize. So we have a a humble spirit that puts Jesus first. We promote Jesus over everything else. And we're going to go and tell about the goodness of God. We're going to tell how wonderful he is. We're going to build his reputation so that everybody else will want to worship him too. Others will know this God that you serve. They will want to be a part of his kingdom. What has Jesus done for you? Put yourself second and boldly proclaim him as the first love of your life. No matter what you're afraid of, no matter what is stopping you, proclaiming Jesus is an act of humility. So try it. Do it today. Do it right now. Find somebody. Tell them. Tell them what God has done for you. We're looking at this question. What does God expect a humble walk to look like? And we've thought about some ideas, some things that we can step into But I want you to know that when you decide to follow Jesus and to lay down your own life and to be as humble as you can, right? We're going to be as humble as we can. Know that you are not vulnerable because of that. You have a God who sticks up for you because of that. Proverbs 29, 23 says, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. In the book of Numbers, we learn Moses was the most meek man on the face of the earth. To be meek is to be gentle and free from pride. Moses was so dependent on God that there was no room in his life to put himself first. He had devoted himself completely to the service of the Lord. Moses was in ministry with his family. He had a brother named Aaron and a sister named Miriam, and all three of them were working together to fulfill God's plan of taking his people into the promised land. Numbers chapter 12 tells us the story of Miriam and Aaron grumbling against the decision Moses had made. And when God heard that conversation, he was not pleased. He was going to stick up for Moses. Numbers 12, 1 through 3. And Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and to Aaron and unto Miriam, Come out ye three into the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. Okay, so evidently Moses was in the vicinity of this conversation, possibly in the same room, because the Lord called all three out. Now if you can imagine being in what you consider a private conversation, and you're upset and you're talking, but the Lord hears. And the Lord calls them out. This gives us insight into God's personality. He sticks up for the humble. Moses was there, but Moses didn't say a word. He allowed that conversation to take place because he was very meek. But God, who cares for the lowly, he took care of it. If Moses was too meek to defend himself, God would do it for him. Numbers 12, 5 through 9. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all my house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall be beheld. Wherefore, Then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. So if you remember back 
in the book of Genesis. Talked about this earlier. Adam and Eve, they both ate that forbidden fruit. And God had a little meeting with Adam, Eve, and Satan (laughs) to discuss the consequences of sin. Here we find another meeting between Aaron, Miriam, and Moses. But God is standing up for Moses. And what God is acknowledging here is the close relationship that he has with Moses. He is standing up for Moses. He's telling them that what he and Moses have is something so special and so personal, so private, that they wouldn't understand it if they tried. When we submit to Jesus and work to promote what he cares about, then he will support our reputations. If nobody else hears what's going on in the room, God hears. And he isn't afraid to take wrong thinking and make it right. Isaiah 61.10 tells us, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. Satan wants us to worry about our reputations. He wants us to be very consumed with what other people are saying about us. He wants us to waste a lot of time bent out of shape over the conversations and thoughts of others. But here God proves that if he be for us, who can be against us? Walk humbly with Jesus. Put him first and see him stand up for you over and over again. He will fight for you. He will make it right. Trust God. Humility or the willingness to put others first, it's not a quality we possess on our own. Uh, We tend to be the complete opposite of that on our own. But it is something that we acquire through Jesus. We acquire this spirit of humility by being around the Lord. In Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30, Jesus tells us, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How does God want us to respond to the heavy burdens of life? By resting in his humility. God is self-existent. He is the first and the last, the was, the is, and the is to come. Nobody had to teach Jesus anything. He already knew it because he was the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus was perfect from the beginning. And when we go and we sit next to him, we talk to him, converse with him, and take on his yoke, take on his humility, his meekness, then we can walk and do things that otherwise we just are not able to do. When we learn of who Jesus is and his ways, we take on his nature. His very presence humbles us. You may have heard the saying, tell me who your five closest friends are and I'll tell you your future. Well, it's the same thing. Who is your best friend? Who are you hanging out with? Who are you around? That's who you're going to be like. When you hang around Jesus, you're going to be like Jesus. So the book of Revelation tells us that right now and for all of eternity, our position beasts and angels standing around the throne of God, worshiping him in the beauty of holiness. They declare his holiness saying, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. What is it about Jesus that makes him so worthy of our praise? God dwelt among us, took on life as a humble servant and died for our sins. He is the very epitome of what it is to put other people first. Being humble is an experience we have through being crucified with Christ. And I wrote a book called Right Well. It's a 31-day guided journey into emotional health through the Word of God. If you're interested in aligning your emotions with the Word of God, visit AshleyEdis.com and you can find this book and many others that deal with emotions and humility and how to walk out this love that we have for Jesus. And in Matthew 26, Jesus talks about his testimony. He talks about breaking the bread. He talks about being humble, and he says, take, eat, this is my body. Jesus humbles himself through the cross by allowing his testimony to be one of injustice, indignity, 
and indifference. Pilate knew Jesus was innocent, yet he allowed Jesus to receive the punishment of a guilty man. Jesus did not think himself above being falsely accused. He knew injustice would lead to victory. Jesus' death was not a simple death. Those who persecuted him wanted him to feel the sting of humiliation. They mocked him, beat him, and stripped him naked. They forced him to receive indignity when he deserved honor. The soldiers and onlookers who witnessed Jesus carrying his cross and later saw his suffering did so with indifference to his pain. And Jesus had come so they could live for eternity, and yet they enjoyed seeing him die. Their indifference to his pain made him a spectacle. If anyone could be justified in pride, it would be Jesus. But he doesn't snub his nose at us. He doesn't hold grudges or remember sins. He invites us to sit with him and take on his meekness as our own. He wants to correct our mistakes, not hold them against us. What does God require of us to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God? How do we get there? More Jesus in our lives. So if you are in a situation and you want to be humble, you want to be more humble, or you feel the sting of pride in your life, we're going to pray right now that God would release that humility, that humble spirit, the meekness that He possesses, and He would impart it into our, our awareness, our knowledge, our hearts, that everything we would say and do would reflect His nature. In Jesus' name, Lord, I thank You for my friends. I thank You for going to the cross and dying for us. I thank You for putting up with injustice and indifference. Lord, I thank You that You did not hold our sins against us, but You freely forgive and so, God, we freely forgive those who have caused us pain. We freely forgive injustices in our life. We want to walk in meekness, to be like Moses, and to be a friend of God. So we thank you that you are, even now, this very moment, giving us a spirit of meekness that we can walk in. Through your word, you are opening the door to a greater walk with you where we can experience what it is to truly be crucified with Christ, to put our lives in yours to abide in you in the safety and the shelter of who you are and what you did. So we thank you, Lord, for all your goodness and your mercy and that you love us and care for us. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you have enjoyed this week's episode and I would love to hear what the Lord has put on your heart. I invite you to join me for a live Bible study on Facebook or YouTube every day at 5 a.m. Central. In this study, we are moving faith forward as we connect with Jesus by making Him the first thought on our mind. Visit AshleyEnis.com to find books, Bible studies, and more. And you can always find me on Facebook or YouTube.